Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Ramah Garib, the coordinator of the master's program in architecture and urban design here in Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies. Um, thank you very much for coming on Thursday evenings. Um, I know it's very busy outside in Doha, but thank you again for being here with us. Um, today, um, as for every year, we have been blessed of having Professor Oliver Watson with us. Um, Professor Oliver Watson contributed to our program um, with teaching in our decorative uh, and ornamentation course within the master's program, and we always get fascinated with his research and topics that he was able to share with us through the public lectures that he conducts within QFIS. Um, as some of you already know, but for the others, Professor Oliver, um, his career basically is in, um, I would say, pottery, right? And um, uh, historic objects within the Islamic world. Um, he ended his career with uh, being the director of uh, the Museum of Islamic Arts. And uh, again, we had this uh, pleasure with, uh, what do you say, agreement with the University of Oxford and QF with his support and knowledge into our program. Um, last year, we had a magnificent lecture uh, related to um, China work and um, pottery within the Abbasid period, and today with the tables of the Ottoman period. I won't take long. Please, Professor Oliver. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I had, yeah. we can turn that one off. Yes, sure. No so if you forgive me, I'll stand over here. Um, when giving the talk. It's not about, um, I have to say, Ottoman tables, because there is only the one table. Uh, and really, this is um, a talk uh, in which I wanted to share with you some of the agonies which, as a curator, you go through when trying to decide whether an object is real or not, whether it is of the date that it's supposed to be, or whether it is modern, faked, or forged. Uh, and whether you are justified in s recommending that the museum, in this case, spend a very large amount of public money on acquiring an object. And this particular case that we're looking at, the case of the Ottoman table, is something that faced me when I was in my first years at the Victoria and Albert Museum. I was quite young, I was quite junior, and I was faced with recommending spending what in those days was almost a world record price for a piece of Islamic art. Let's see if this, uh, this works. Uh, I call it a detective story because the process that we go through as a curator looking at an object is very much like you might do at the scene of a crime. You're looking for uh, a motive. In this case, why a coffee table? You're looking for the means to commit the crime i.e., is the technology right, is the style right, and then the opportunity about where and when would such a piece actually be made. This piece was offered for auction uh, in 1986 in London. It was completely unknown before, and it was catalogued as being mid-16th century, and they compared it to a very famous object in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, which is the traveling throne of Suleiman the Magnificent himself. It's done in the same technique, marquetry work, so these are veneers, thin veneers cut together of ebony and ivory. And we knew about this throne because there had been a series of uh, big exhibitions traveling the world on Ottoman art coming from, coming from Turkey then. But as soon as it appeared in the auction catalog, Almost all the scholars, the collectors, and the dealers said, nah, can't be right, can't be real. Why? Well, we've never seen one before. What would the Ottomans want with a coffee table? And one of the um, recurrent themes here is that a rather simplistic view of Islamic culture from the West is that we know what Islamic furnishing is like in the past. We know they don't have tables, they only have carpets. So it, it doesn't fit in. 
so a series of objections to this object came up. Mostly, it's a unique piece, no other one is known, what is it doing? And then other arguments about having the wood and the tile together, this is very strange. Uh, and the contrast between the black and white decoration of the woodwork and this uh, polychrome decoration of the tile is a, really a bit too much. And so this discussion was going on informally between people before the auction and at the sale, it very strangely fetched a price that was neither these prices look incredibly modest now. At the time, these were very, very big prices for such objects. Uh, these pieces were fetching enormous sums, Isnik pottery, uh, Ottoman silver that had start, started to come to the market. But this price, so 50, uh, you know, only two thirds of the price for a small silver jug or a rather, I mean, it's perfectly nice, but it's not a very special piece of Isnik pottery. This price is much too much if this is not a 16th century object uh, and much, much too little if it is a 16th century object. But the general consensus was that actually it was a 19th century object because it fitted in very well the context to European oriental taste furnishing. In the late 19th century, throughout Europe and in the United States, there was a great fashion for what were called oriental interiors. And these were bizarre mixtures of styles, um, mixtures of, forgive me, I'll get my pointer, of real objects, but put together in a, in a, in a fantastic way. So in this case, we see here, this is real Isnik tiles of the 16th century, these are Syrian tiles of the 17th century, this is 19th century um, work from Damascus, this is modern work with modern reproductions on it, but all put together to call what they, to, to form what they used to call a coin turc, a Turkish corner, where um, a gentleman would be able to put on their smoking jackets and smoke cigars in the, uh, in the evening. And this was a big fashion across Europe. So uh, here are some more examples of these interiors. And you see where the kind of our coffee table might have fitted in very well to this, to this environment. Even a Victorian uh, Turkish bath up on the, on, the, on the left there. And of course, if we want to find parallels for the table, it is exactly here we find them. So a whole lot of, in different styles, these low, polygonal tables, in this case even with a tile as, as the top piece. So the general consensus was, did I do something? Forgive me. Um, the general consensus was this is where our tile uh, fitted in uh, amongst this family of 19th century pieces. There was some discussion which didn't just say this table was completely wrong. And indeed, there were a number of, as it were, possible verdicts uh, for the table. One was that both the tile and the wood, wooden part, the wood, were wrong. They weren't 16th century. One was that the tile was wrong, but the wood was right. And the other way round, that the wood was wrong, but the tile was right. A rather more interesting proposal was that they were actually both 16th century, but they didn't belong together. They'd been put together at a later date. And only finally, the verdict which would make it a real piece was that they're both right and that they do belong together. So we are dealing with a 16th century table. So the process I went through, I was very interested in this piece because I had a sneaking suspicion that actually it was real. So I went through a series of sort of testing all of these hypotheses. The first one, that they're both right, but they don't belong together. Well, for me, this, the coincidence here would be far too great. An Isnik tile of this size and shape 
and we're talking, I think it's sort of 50 centimeters in, in diameter, is almost unheard of. I mean, there are, are some other big tiles, but they're extremely rare. And I don't know of any other that's 12-sided. Ottoman furniture, which might have been cut down um, to insert such a tile into, is also extraordinarily rare. And in fact, it only exists in the collections uh, in Istanbul, in the Islamic Museum and the top Topkapi Palace there. So the idea that somehow you'd have found part of one of these which you could cut across here and then insert a tile that just happened to fit into it, I thought that, that we can leave that out. That's too far-fetched. Is it one tile or a series of tiles put together? One tile. Oh. One piece. Yes, I should say that. I mean, it is, it is extraordinary as a, as, a, as a tile. So here it is, 50 centimeters in diameter. It, it's been broken and, and mended, but it is, it, it is originally one piece. Well, luckily, we know quite a lot about Iznik tiles. There are still many installed in buildings for which they were, they were made uh, in, in Ottoman Turkey. Uh, and there are lots in museum collections so that we, we know the material, we can study it quite closely. And there is no problem at all in relating this tile in its manufacture, in its style, in its materials, in every quality to real Iznik tiles. The closest parallel, interestingly enough, are these tiles which occur around the mihrab of the Suleymaniyah Mosque in Istanbul. So the mosque that Suleyman the Magnificent built, finished in 1560. And you see here this decoration on the border of the tile is very similar to the decoration uh, around the, of these tiles around the tile of our table. And so we can, there is no problem. And I think after a while, everyone agreed that actually this tile, there wasn't anything wrong with this tile. So the tile was right. Is the wood wrong? This is much more difficult for us to establish because Ottoman furniture of any quality, as I say, is extremely rare. Pieces in the Topkapi Palace Museum, not easy to get into and to examine closely. Almost nothing anywhere else. Looking closely at the table, we discovered a number of things that suggested to us, yes, it was real. One is that the veneer is very thick. And in the 16th century, when they were cutting veneer, cutting the thin sheets from, from wood and ivory, they didn't have the kind of very precise mechanical methods that we have, have had since the 19th century in, um, to do this. And the thick veneer, even of itself, suggested that it was of early date. The other thing that was interesting is that the piece had undergone at least two series of repairs. Um, I think we see that in the... The next slide, that here, the marquetry work, this is what we think is the original marquetry work, and this whole element here has been replaced. It looks very similar at first sight, similar materials, but then when you look, actually, this is not as quite as precisely drawn, this octopus motif, as we called it, and the Chintamani pattern with the three dots together here are, are spreading out in a, in a rather haphazard fashion. But it's quite good work, so that seemed to be one moment of repair. The other is when, and I think this is when the tile on the top was broken, I imagine somebody standing on it to the piece to reach up and the tile snapped underneath. And when they mended the tile, they put in this rather horrible, completely modern piece, cross piece, sort of banged in, quite clearly not part of the, of the original thing to support it. So at least two moments of, of, of repair. But when we look at the actual quality of the woodwork itself, this is really rather remarkable. This is very fine joinery. 12-sided, um, but only six legs, so the, the sides have to uh, have an angle sort of halfway across. Um, a number of different panels to put it together, these nice little half capitals which were there to support the tile. It's painted, has at least three coats of a red paint on the inside, which 
uh, the original material uh, furniture in, in top copy also has. And when you compare it with the sort of underside of a 19th century piece, you can see quite clearly the difference in, in quality and skill. We did eventually manage to, uh, no, that's giving the game away if I say that. Uh, this is an ex exploded, exploding drawing, I'm not sure what the technical term is, which shows the quite elaborate, detailed way uh, of joinery to put the table together. And interestingly, given this amount of very fine quality, there was no sign in the table that it had been repurposed, that it had been cut down, it had been put together, it had been reused. It looked like an in integral piece of furniture. And then there was the comparison with the throne of Suleiman, which is in um, the top copy. It's called the traveling throne because, in fact, it does knock apart. Uh, it sort of flat packs, if you like, uh, into the various boards. And there are a number, you can see at once, a number of stylistic comparisons. These octopus motifs we find in slightly elongated form here on the throne. There are other elements. The little roundels here occur on the top. And the basic technique, this is ivory and ebony, ivory and ebony marquetry work uh, put together. So the comparison with the table, again, added support to the idea that our table is, in fact, real. But another interesting thing, and this is uh, the, the privilege you have as a museum curator of getting very close to objects, is how closely the tile relates to the table. Isnit tiles are normally made with quite a broad edge, margin, which are then trimmed down before the tiles are installed. And this is true of tile wall tiles, um, and it's true here. So you see the, 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 the as it were, the, the line, the guideline there, and then the piece has been trimmed back to fit, and it fits very, very neatly into the piece of furniture. What's more, puzzling about what such a tile could be used for if it wasn't for a table. Uh, many people said, well, it's very worn. It's probably a floor tile. Well, this actually is really puzzling because there is no documented example at all of any decorated Isnik tile ever being used on the floor. And in fact, what one can see is that a lot of the wear is rather uh, poor quality conservation work done when the tile was broken. When it was broken, it was mended, it was stuck together again, and then it was sanded to make the join a bit flatter. And interestingly enough, so that's a sort of across the middle of the tile, I think you can just see the brake line running there. And interestingly, at the edge, we find that there is a lot of wear exactly parallel to the wooden border that held it in. But where, and where the wood came over the top of it to hold it in, there is no wear at all. In other words, this has been scraped clean while it was sitting in its wooden frame. So more and more bits, small bits of evidence that build up to suggest that we're dealing with an integral object. So I was at this stage saying, well, we have, we have the means. We know this kind of joinery work, the marquetry work, the way it's put together, is possible for the mid-16th century. We know stylistically that it relates in some way to uh, Ottoman furniture, but can we give it a, a more secure context in the development of Ottoman design? And luckily, after a bit of research in uh, some quite obscure work, uh, books and so forth, we, I was able to put together a sequence of dated or datable Ottoman furniture, wooden decorated pieces, that showed quite a consistent development from the late 15th century through to the early 17th century. The earliest pieces are these two small box boxes with ivory and ebony beading, which we see on the later pieces as well. By that I mean this sort of alternating 
motif down the edges of the, of the box with micro mosaic work. So this is very fine uh, um, mosaics of different colored woods and ivory and bone put together to form very uh, small detailed patterns and ivory panels carved in relief. Now this box, the one on the left, uh, it bears a dedication. It was made for the treasury of Bayezid II, who was the Ottoman Sultan from 1481 to 1512. And the box itself bears a date, as it says there, of 888 of 1483. And by chance, this other box appeared uh, more recently, uh, made for Bayezid's son and dated only 10 years later, but the same technique, the, the raised ivory carved plaques, the micro mosaic, the ivory and ebony beadwork. The next piece we can look at has rather bolder beadwork along the edges and is entirely decorated with ivory in carved in relief set in a walnut. This is actually a walnut veneer over the top of a, of a, uh, of a base frame. And this piece, this is a Quran box, the whole of the dome hinges back to, to accept a Quran written in seven or, or, or more volumes. And it is dated 1505, 9-11 Hijri, 1505. And again, this sits in the, in the top copy museum. The next piece looks suddenly stylistically very different. Uh, it's got, it's a much richer set of, uh, of motifs. We still have the micro mosaic work here. We have the, the beading round the frame, but we have much more elaborate marquetry work in ivory and ebony. And some of the motifs which we've recognized already in our table and the throne, the sort of uh, octopus uh, uh, cloud pattern. But a jumble, I would call it, as a piece of design, it's not terribly coherent. It's sort of a jumble of different motifs put in wherever they fit. But stylistically and technically, it is leading on to the throne of Suleiman, dated 1550 or 1560, about then, though this has a much more coherent design sense. There's been more discipline in, in putting the, the motifs together. When we come towards the end of the 16th century, there is a dramatic change, though, in uh, woodwork of this kind. These are doors for the pavilion of Murad III, dating sometime in the last quarter of the 16th century, and we find completely new materials. The ebony, the black wood, has almost disappeared. It's used in very small areas for some of the framing bands, and is replaced by tortoiseshell and mother of pearl. So rather than the the plain, austere black and white of ivory and ebony, we now have these much more rich, uh, variegated colors uh, of tortoiseshell uh, and mother of pearl. And it gives a very brilliant, uh, different effect. Though the underlying technique, but I'm going to take this off completely in case that's, unless somebody is objecting to what I'm saying, and you speak up. The, I would say the underlying technology is the same. These are thin veneers of mother of pearl and tortoiseshell, which are cut and, as in marquetry work, then placed together to form the pattern. And it is this kind of work that then dominates fine Ottoman furniture from this moment on. So here, a, uh, another Quran, tall Quran box, made by the court architect Ahmed Karvus, uh, who was a uh, court architect from 1598 to 1605. And I'm sorry, I don't have a color photograph of this, but all of these panels and the dome, this is uh, mother of pearl and, and tortoiseshell. Still quite strongly organized in a design sense, the, 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 the rather rigorous geometric patterning. 
And when we get into the 17th century, uh, we have continuation, mother of pearl, tortoiseshell, but a much more ebullient, um, looser kind of design. And this is the throne of Ahmed I, who ruled from 1603 to 1617. So a great profusion of these very rich materials, and then also studied with pieces of jade, turquoise, and, and other precious stones. And I believe an emerald the size of your fist hanging from the top there. And this is what then, from now on, through the 17th, 18th, and into the 19th century, even today, it is tortoiseshell and mother of pearl that form the, the um, as it were, the basic aesthetic of pieces of furniture of this kind. Though I do warn you, if you get a modern piece, it's likely to be plastic mother of pearl and plastic tortoiseshell that, that make up the piece. So here, I think, between what I've always thought of as a rather experimental piece, with its wild design and its mixture of the old-fashioned raised uh, carved ivory plaques in relief with micro-mosaic and then the marquetry work, so uh, an experimental development piece, and the more disciplined throne of Suleiman, that it's exactly here that our table fits. And of course, it's nice that it fits there, given that the tile itself relates so closely to Suleiman's mosque, the, the tiles around the mihrab uh, in his mosque. So if I go back to my. So Sorry, was, yes. So was that table, did that table belong to any of the family? Well, I'll talk a bit about where I think it, it comes from. It, it has no documentary evidence. And my second question would be like, such tables were made in Arab countries that were like under the influence of the Ottoman Empire, so could be, that table could be coming from Syria or Egypt, because such tables were made at that time as well. Well, uh, that's a very good point for discussion afterwards. Let me c carry on with this. There is no documentary evidence exactly where it fits. It's all stylistic and, and quali uh, quality. So my slightly um, tendentious crime scene, I see, I think, the me, oops, sorry, the means, yes, we have the means, they can work this kind of furniture, it's part of the technology, uh, they have it stylistically, it fits into the mid-16th century, the real problem is the motive, why do they want a coffee table? We don't use tables in the Islamic Middle East. So that is the Big question. Well, here again, it's practice at the Ottoman court and records of ceremonies there that explain this to us. What we're looking at here is the Grand Council Chamber uh, in the second court of the Topkapi Palace. It's not a very big, as much in the Topkapi. The, the architecturally, it doesn't seem very big and impressive, but this was the center of the Ottoman Empire. It was here that the Grand Vizier would sit and hold council with his ministers. It was here that foreign ambassadors would come uh, for negotiation. It was here that citizens would come to plead their cause. The Grand Vizier would sit here on this divan, on the bench along the wall, with his other ministers, the grill above is where the sultan himself might come and sit unseen to hear what is going on and check that things are going uh, properly. And I discovered one description of a, uh, a moment in this court dating from the early 17th century, but it seems to describe a practice that, that had some history. This is by a gentleman known as Ottaviano Bon. He was the Venetian representative in the, at the Ottoman court. So he was an intimate in the ceremonies that happened there. And he describes the function of the court like this. And I will just read out a short passage. Uh, if I can find my... Okay. 
So he says, everybody is occupied with these matters. And this is the hearing of lawsuits, essentially, from the mor in the morning till midday when the hour for dining arrives, at which time one of the stewards receives orders from the Grand Vizier to serve the food, whereupon all the people are immediately dismissed from the room in which, when it is all clear, the tables are arranged as follows. One is set in front of the Grand Vizier and one or possibly two other pashas. A similar arrangement is made for the other pashas who all eat together and also with other officials. Servants spread napkins over each person's knee to preserve his garments and then bring them the meats, having handed to everybody a trencher with all kinds of bread, fresh and good in every case. The meats are brought in one by one and set down in the middle of the trencher in a large roomy dish and when one is finished, they remove it and bring another. So this is a light Ottoman lunch, I think. Uh, the usual fare being mutton, guinea fowl, pigeons, goose, lambs, chickens, soup made of rice, and vegetables prepared in various ways, and an assortment of pastries for dessert, the whole being eaten with great speed. So here we have the motive, if you like, the, 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 the function of the table, that at a certain moment in this very room, tables are brought and set in front of the, the senior officials as they sit on the divan, divans around the side. On top of these trenchers, I imagine large trays are placed and then the food is placed on top of that. Now what we're looking at here, again, is an early 17th century painting of a, a dinner given by the Grand Vizier in honor of the ambassador of the Habsburg Empire in 1628. And another example, again, another European painting of slightly later in the century in the same room. I think the painter has misremembered because actually this, is, this side is a window with a grill giving out onto the courtyard. Uh, but nevertheless, here is the divan, here is the grill behind which the Sultan himself might sit, here is the Grand Vizier, in this case with the ambassador, and here are the tables with the trays on top. And looking at Ottoman sources, as well as European sources, and looking at miniature painting, we see that tables used, small low tables used to support trays for food and dining are in fact quite a common occurrence. So here in the late 16th century, uh, a mini an Ottoman miniature painting showing a feast held outside and on the, the large metal tray with the candlesticks and the, and the bunches of flowers in, in pots and the fruit and food, you see the tray is placed here, are the legs with the arched openings just as on our table and indeed the black and, this is black and gold may indeed represent the kind of ivory and ebony decoration we were seeing. And this, uh, such illustrations can be expanded. So not only in the council chamber, but here these are at outside parties, and of course there were many other rooms in the top carpi where similar events happened. So I would argue that this table is unique only in that this is the only one to have survived, but that actually this would have been perhaps a common type of table, maybe dozens of them made in exactly this form, for use in the court of the, the Ottoman court, for the Grand Council Chamber, for other meetings, as a normal function uh, of, of Ottoman dining practice that the trays are set on small, low tables. So it's not just a 19th century coffee table, it is a 16th century dining table. The fact that it is such an item is not such a rare, rarity is indicated by the fact that tiles survive. Tiles of ceramics are very tough material. They don't disappear in the same way that wood will disappear. Uh, and there are quite a number of tiles. I have records of maybe more than a dozen, usually octagonal, so not quite as fancy as, as the one we've been looking at but of the similar scale, so 45, 50 centimeters in diameter, 
and I can't think of any other use for these other than being the tops of tables. They don't form part of any wall tiling scheme that we can, we can imagine. And the fact that they, they, they all have a similar uh, radial design, they could all look perfectly good as our tile does in our table. And odd uses for tiles, this may seem an odd use for a tile, but odd uses for tiles we can demonstrate. I'm rather um, fond of this. These are a number of tiles, not as big as the tabletops, but rather larger than a sort of standard um, hexagonal tiles, which were used for wall decoration. But they have this curious hole punched in the middle, a hole punched before as the piece is being made. That's part of the original manufacture. And people have suggested these are for fountains or for, I don't know, for putting on the ceiling and a chain hanging through them. But there is a reference in 1578 to the order from the palace for 2,300 tiles to decorate the stern of the recently ordered royal boat. When I heard that, I thought, well, you can't tile a boat. A boat's made of wood. It sits in the water as it moves. An ordinary method of sticking a tile, which is on plaster on the wall, it will, it will bend, it will break, the tiles will drop off. But if you have a hole in the middle, you can put a pin, a metal pin fastening nail through the piece, covered with a nice gilt top, to hold it firm. So my suggestion is maybe that's what these tiles are for, the tiling of, of some kind of um, particular uh, use like that. And there is another group of tiles of this shape. Isnic tiles, these are all second half of the 16th century, uh, but rectangular in particularly this sort of dimension. And again, we've never really known what these are. They don't seem to be wall tiles. They have this one with an inscription round. It seems to be a very self-contained object. And it was actually the writing which suddenly made me think of this that the practice of a common piece of furniture from the 16th century onwards, this is Suleiman the Magnificent himself, um, are writing boxes so that as you sit cross-legged on the floor, you have a low table which can have a drawer for pens, for ink and so forth, uh, is rectangular of this size. And indeed the proportions are exactly the same as this set of tiles. So again, I propose that although the surviving boxes, there isn't one with a tile top, I propose that these tiles are actually evidence for a series of pieces of furniture with a tile top. So, more and more, I'm feeling more relaxed about recommending to my institution to buy this object for a very large amount of money, that we've found a whole context, a technical, a stylistic, uh, a chronological context for this piece of furniture and a use for it that, it, that it had a function. Deal quickly with a couple of the other objections, tile and woodwork, that doesn't work together. Well, actually, in the Topkapi Palace, we find quite often in interior decoration, in this case, you have a wooden surround for the little wall niches with a tiled interior. And there exist tiles which are evidently the, the niche opening. Uh, and there exist in the top copy such tiles which give, give in to wooden cupboards behind. So wooden tile together, perfectly fine in Ottoman practice. The contrasting aesthetic between the colored tile and the austere black and white well, this piece, if this was made for Suleiman the Magnificent, it is possible that when he sat on it, he wore a, one of the very austere, one of the most wonderful garments in the top copy. This is a 16th century kaftan in just plain black, and just the lining has this crimson inside, crimson stripe. Of bit. He may have worn that in order to match the, the aesthetic of the throne, but I expect that he probably wore something a bit more fancy and colorful in, oops, sorry. In fact, something possibly as colorful as this, which was the grandest uh, uh, kaftan in, in their collection. 
And of course, Suleiman himself would not have sat directly on a painted wooden board like that on a throne. There would have had to be some covering, some cushions. And of course, we know of Ottoman 16th century cushion covers, and they're all of very brilliant colors and very strong designs. So this problem of contrasting aesthetics, I think is not, it's a prob we see it as a problem, but it wasn't a problem then. And this mixture, which I see is quite characteristic of the Ottoman high period in the mid 16th century, of quite contrasting aesthetics, some very austere, simple, powerful designs, others highly elaborate and floral, existing together. A parallel I can think of that is in Japan, where you have these extraordinary different aesthetics which all coexist. So, our table finds, I argue, a natural home in mid 16th century uh, Istanbul in the Ottoman Empire. The quality of this particular piece suggests to me that this comes from the top copy. It is the same quality as the other pieces of furniture there. Of course, is this a unique occurrence? Is it only in 16th century Turkey that we find tables? Well, sorry, those were tables in the Islamic world? No. There are enough small pieces of evidence spread across the Islamic world and across time that show us that actually this kind of table has been a regular part of furnishings of buildings across the Islamic Middle East. So on the left here is a wooden, small wooden table, stool, probably functions as both things. It's in wood, paint, uh, decorated with lacquer, with a, a particular technique of painted lacquer. Again, a, an extraordinarily rare survival. Uh, there is this one piece, uh, but pays testimony to what must have been a whole industry of making such pieces of furniture. Later on, in the 12th and 13th century, we find not wooden examples, but pottery examples. Now, this is quite mad, making pottery uh, particularly as a stool, it's not terribly strong here in the way that wood would be, but it's quite clear this is based on a wooden prototype, the way these little legs are turned and so forth, the way the panels are put together. Here we have in pottery examples evidence of a whole industry of wooden furniture making that has vanished. This is an early 14th century textile and in the detail of it, we see the ruler on his throne. We see one man sitting on a probably metal stool, folding stool, but the other sitting on a stool with arch legs between, like ours. And if we start then in the uh, survival of Iranian illustrated manuscripts in the 14th century, allow us to look into sort of furnishings in much more detail than we've been able to before, and we find Constantly. So this is a story from the Shah Nameh. It's the young wife of Rustam coming to his chamber. And there he has his arms and armor placed on small table stools at the back of the room. And here, uh, again in the, in the mid-15th century, another court scene. And in the corner is an angel sitting on a little uh, stool, polygonal stool with arched openings like ours. Here is um, Leila and Majnun story beginning, where Leila and Majnun meet at school, and here is uh, Leila resting on exactly one of our small tables. Not only the use of tables, marquetry work of this kind has a long history as well. We could go back, we trace the Ottoman practice actually back through uh, Mamluk, the Mamluk world, Mamluk Syria and, and Egypt, uh, where there has been a very intensive production of very high quality micro mosaic work and small pieces of uh, marquetry. If we go back further to the Fatimid period, we find fragments of quite elaborate um, marquetry work. So this is the side of a box, probably, with this hawk and, and rabbit in uh, iv ivory and ebony. And you could see there from the close-up the sort of thickness of the material, not as finely worked as the 16th century, but nevertheless the same basic technique. If we go back earlier, we find similar things. And in fact, of course, Egypt being Egypt, 
we can go back really far and find something in Tutankhamun's tomb. Exactly the same process. Ivory, ebony, micro mosaic, marquetry work pinned together to make a wooden box. So this is rare because so few survive. And it's thought impossible, at least it was in thought impossible, by the dealers, the collectors, the curators, when this table was offered for sale, because of a kind of view about what Islamic furniture ought to be. And I feel very strongly that we should stop. I would say we finally did acquire this. I did finally persuade the museum to pay a world record price for a piece of uh, Islamic woodwork, and it's now sits in the Islamic Gallery in the Victoria and Albert Museum. The lesson is that we shouldn't have too much of a view about what things ought to be. We should look at the world and see what they are and then build from that. And the thing is, pieces like this, the f this piece cannot exist on its own. To have the skill uh, to make such a thing implies a whole industry of craft skill that is built up and developed. People making pieces like this continuously. And the fact is all that material disappears because it is fragile, because it is reused, because it ends up as firewood or good. We are just very lucky that one piece does. And constantly we must think about this using historical imagination to see that the past was a much, much richer place than is suggested by what survives in our museums. I'll rush through the last few pieces, but wood as a material hardly appears in museum collections or in publications on Islamic material culture and on Islamic art because so little of it survives. It rots away, it can be repurposed, it, can, it burns, it's useful as fuel. But the few small fragments, perhaps an early Fatimid part of a decorative furniture, a small box for holding a jeweler's scales, a whole craft of decorative lacquer work. These, this is a particular kind of a varnish which is applied in layers to, the, to turned wooden boxes and then the layers scrape back to reveal the different colors in patterns. Elaborate things known in a few solitary examples and fragments from the rubbish dumps at Fustat, but again testimony to a whole industry, so a whole environmental, you know, visual, part of the visual environment of people's lives which is almost lost to us. Paint, varnished painted wood things. Uh, this perhaps of the late Fatimid or Ayyubid period, a bit later, later still, uh, probably 16th century, carved wooden boxes. So these are a few extremely rare surviving things. The box of Ulu Beg, a wonderful Chinese dragon on the front, marquetry work from Egypt and so forth. So, for me, this was a very interesting process, one of which I started off with a terrible anxiety, worry, that my colleague's judgment was going to make this piece disappear, and we wouldn't see it again, and I had a hunch it was really right. And then months of nervous tension and not in my stomach, as I wanted to prove this real, I wanted the museum to spend a very large amount of money on it, but was I right? And finally, compiling enough evidence it's not only me, I have to say, I had to convince uh, my new colleagues as well. So in the end, the piece, finally, and it's the only piece of Ottoman furniture outside of Istanbul. Thank you. Thank you. Again, as usual, you impress us with your research. Um, please, if there's any questions, please go ahead. The professor would be more than helpful to answer. Thank you. I'm interested in the uh, fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. It's really enlightening. So I, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the chairs. Uh, you talked about where the uh, Grand Vizier would sit 
What about the others? What, what kind of chairs would they sit on? Uh, in the council chamber, there are no chairs. There are only the, the divan, the um, yeah. bench around the wall. Like this one? Like, yes, but they said they're, 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 yeah. built, they're architecturally built into the wall around, yeah. as I remember, two sides. And everyone else, I think, stood. The ambassador, the guest, ah, sitting on the other the side of the table. I haven't looked. There yeah. must be some small... Because do I understand that the, uh, the Middle Eastern uh, way of sitting is to recline, and the European way of sitting is to be stiff? Is the Ottoman like the European, or did they have both? You are suggesting a very interesting line of research that I have not followed up. Oh. Uh, well, that's nice. <laughs> I was into these as that they are small tables for putting a tray on, but they're also stools for sitting on. Uh -huh. And the, the miniatures and so forth show that. But it would be a different line of research for me to look into seating furniture altogether. And there is evidence the, um, you know, the, the, the Mongol textile with the throne man and the man on one side with a folding chair. On the ah, other one yeah. of these wooden stools. So there's, uh, there's obviously a variety of, of arrangements. But what is quite clear is that there's a sort of very simplistic European view is that all Muslims sit on carpets on the floor and there isn't any, isn't any furniture. It's just wrong. Of course. So when did you um, buy it, actually? When did the VNA buy it? It was sold at auction to an American collector who phoned me up one evening to ask me about it, and I was saying, well, actually, I'd convinced, well, this was several months after the sale, I convinced myself it was right, I said, well done, it's a fantastic thing, I'm going to. And then about a month after that, his agent, his dealer, came to me and said, he doesn't want it, he'll sell it to you, but for twice what he paid for it. That was a bit difficult to persuade the museum. <laughs> so at the end, we had to pay 40,000 pounds for it. 1986 was a enormous sum of money, but I think as a piece of investment, if you like, for the state, uh, now such a piece would be hundreds of thousands. So, as a museum curator, we do not get into value. We are not interested in monetary value at all. Yeah. <laughs> it is worrying when you know you're spending, you know, very large yeah. sums of public money. You want it to be um, worthwhile. It's <coughs> a wonderful detective story. Probably the most famous detective story in England is Piltdown. Everybody knows about Piltdown, and when it was found, and the question was they wanted to believe it was real, even though a, a very careful analysis would have shown that it wasn't. Yeah. But people wanted to believe it was, and it stayed that way until fluorine, discovery of fluorine testing in the 1950s. That was almost 50 years. Um, so I was thinking about that when you were talking about this. So I asked you a, a reverse question. What in that uh, table do you think might have first led you to believe that it wasn't real? That it wasn't. That it wasn't, yeah. Because you can't make 100% a, a, a no, conclusion. You, you can't. It's interesting you say that about Phil Dan and wanting to believe. I do, I'm interested. As a museum person, you have to be interested in fakes and forgeries because there is so much in the art trade and it is, it's, and so I've got interest in it as a historic thing. And people wanting to believe is one of the most common ways that big mistakes are made. That you find something that seems just like a piltdown. So it fills the gap, it proves an argument, it says what you want it to say, and you go ahead. And that's, you know, wishful thinking is the, is the biggest thing. I may have been guilty in this case. I had quite. A, I had uh, some tough colleagues who I had to kind of work, work with the argument through. But it's also a matter, in this case, of looking at the material closely. And I find, and this is one of my concerns about uh, the teaching of art history and, uh, and so forth in universities these days, is that people learn art history from images that are this size on the wall, and they don't much spend time with the real thing. 
the museum curator has the one privilege of actually handling stuff. And I had been following the big Ottoman exhibitions that had been going around, and I loved the, the, the woodwork there because it was something entirely new, not something we knew about. Really. And it was when I saw this piece and I looked at it closely, I thought, this, it's the same stuff. You know, the, the, the material qualities are the same. And yet so many of the people engaged in the field sort of don't get close to that. Can go wrong, of course. But I pretty confident in this case that it, that it was right. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's say two questions, or maybe one observation and one question. Uh, when you just mentioned the way of seating, and uh, my, my friend here mentioned that in the Ottoman Empire, they use different ways, let's say, like uh, the Middle Eastern style or the European style, just one observation I realized about the Ottoman Empire because the empire lasted for a long period of time from about 600 years, maybe it started very Middle Eastern, then towards the end it became more European, that's just an observation. Yes. And even when you said like the uh, European uh, like uh, conception of how the, the Ottoman Empire used to sit on the, on the, on the floor, I think that might have been correct at the beginning, but later on they adapted different things like tables and chairs. Absolutely. And uh, second question would be like where these vases are coming from, are they also Ottoman or? Yes. I, this was before uh, you had to get the permission of conservators to do anything in the museum. So I, I just took these, but these are Isnik jugs of the 16th century. They were on the display. I went out and bought some tulips, of course, an Ottoman <laughs> plant originally. And I put them in and I photographed them. Uh, it would be quite difficult to do now. Uh, and I did that partly because in that miniature painting that I showed with the big tray, there are candlesticks with candles and vases with flowers in sitting on the, the tray as well. So it seemed to me to be, a, to be appropriate. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting about the, of course, you know, it's, it's a whole other argument, a, a, a sort of reductionist argument about a European view of, of the Middle East, that it's one thing, and that over all time it's always been one thing, so that we can talk about this is a problem with the display of Islamic art in many museums, that we sort of think we can explain all the Islamic art in a few, a few simple principles. And your, your observations on uh, the Ottoman world, I mean, they start off very much uh, part of a Turkic tribal and then highly Persian influenced court. By the time you get to the 19th century and the Domovaci Palace, I mean, you're in a completely different world. Of, yeah, exactly. The Domovaci yeah. is very yeah. European yeah. architecture. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I am very interested in the fact that when you have been talking about the, the uses of the table and the uses of the throne, um, apparently the tiles are covered when they are being used. So I am wondering, is there a kind of double function in these objects? One of them is wh when they are not used for which they are designed, are they kind of part of the architectural decoration in some way. Um, I mean, just a suggestion. Sorry, I don't quite see. You mean if, if they have a tile top? Yes. Um, for example, when the table is used, there is a metal tray covering it. And when the throne is used, there are cushions on the body of the yes. sultan covering, covering them. So I was wondering, when they are not used, maybe they are in a, on a sort of display so that they can be part of? I, I don't think we know. I mean, the, it, the Ottoman world, I suspect, is one of the places you might find out because there are ar enormous archives from the Ottoman, high Ottoman period surviving, but you need to know Ottoman Turkish, you be, need to be able to, and that's certainly beyond, beyond me. Um, of course, we don't know that the, t the tables all had tile tops. They probably didn't. We don't know that they always had a tray put on top when things were served. It's just the bits of evidence that we have, it, that's, that's what it seems there. I imagine they were actually kept in a storeroom somewhere at the side and were only brought out when there was the function, and then they were put away again. And the interesting thing about, sorry, for, do stop me. If, 
but the, the, the reason that this piece survived, I think it, there was a story that it was found in Egypt at one moment. And for me, it's kind of the, the, the ambassadors, the Ottoman representatives in, and officials in Egypt were occasionally were given things from the old Topkapi collections to decorate their offices and their, their rooms and reception rooms in, in Cairo. And it's just a sort of nice turnaround that, of course, one of the things they would have liked are things that look like the Oriental room, the Coin Turc, the European view of an Islamic room. So the table would have fitted, uh, you know, then. So that's maybe why it came, you know, found in a dusty corner of a storeroom in the top copy and brought out, restored. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Just me. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, they're old. 16th yes. century. They're, they're, 16, they're of the same period. Okay. Um, I might have a question. Is it the tiles instead of wood top because of the water use, like water spilling? It as could a well be. As it's a, a functional very, it's a very like, use it's rather very than the wood because wood by time would have been rotten and yeah. uh, like soften and then all the decorations. If you somehow. spill if you spill your, your your lamb and your guinea fowl and all your food so on it, the wood is it going to be. It could be more functional so that at that time they would be using more tiles than Yes. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible, of course. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Oliver. Thank you for this great lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, of course we hope to see you again next year <laughs> among us and with our students and public. And uh, please join us for a bite outside and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you very much.